Welcome to Oversharing with the Overbees. I'm Joe. And I'm Matt. And each week you can tune in to hear us respond to your voicemails, go in depth on our lives as content creators, and hopefully leave you feeling even better than we found you. With that being said, let's get to Oversharing. For usual, this is the second time we've sat down and tried to record. You're darn right it is. Matt has this thing. Mm -hmm. It's called ADHD. ADHD. Oh, wow. (laughs) Simpatico. Matt's feeling extra ADHD today. Ah, only recently medicated, like seconds before the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see if it kicks in. I hope so. Yeah. So what is it like living with ADHD? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know any other way. That's the thing. Like to me, it's just how you live life. Yeah. But um does it feel as frantic as it appears? As it looks. Mm -hmm. um see for me it's like it's only frantic sometimes like that's when you get stuff done is when it's frantic like when the Mm -hmm. the anxiety really peaks and like you get worried about your deadlines or whatever you're doing but for the most part eh, yeah it's all right how is it dealing with the frustration that other people don't uh see the urgency that you do (laughs) in those moments I don't know. See, I think that's a little, uh, you just have a different way. Like, because I feel like if I'm feeling the urgency, it is truly urgent. Like we are out of time to work on the project. Uh huh. Whereas you're just like, well, we'll just not finish the project. And I'm like, well, that's not an option. (laughs) I can't accept that. Yeah. I'm like, I have waited exactly as long as I can to actually finish what we're doing. Right. And I, what I'm trying to enforce to you Mm -hmm. is that that was too long because you don't have time to receive help from me in that capacity. Um, okay. Okay. So if you want a partner in crime, the urgency comes earlier. Gotcha. So we're just not going to finish projects and see how that makes you feel. I feel like sometimes you don't respond. So I have like two deadlines. There's a deadline of like, we can work on this comfortably. And, like, that's usually a softer deadline, but, like, if we start now, we can do it at, like, a reasonable pace. Uh And then there is a deadline of, like, if you start right now and you never stop, you can get it done. If you start any later than this, you will not get it done. Or it will be done very poorly. I'm sure somebody listening relates. And I think, like, that first deadline usually doesn't always resonate for you and then the second one you're like i don't no i'm not working that much to get this done it's not worth it to me there's nothing i feel that strongly about exactly we're back better than ever (laughs) uh i don't have anything good to intro in on no other than today we're gonna talk about division of labor we are yeah so and i think it's gonna go a little long so we're switching up the podcast format but we posted a tiktok and i actually I, I said this in my caption of the TikTok. I copied this concept from somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was to the Bluey theme song where it's like, do, 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 mom. Do. Yeah. Dad. You yeah. Know? And uh, it's been a really popular trend on TikTok, the parenting sphere for yeah. a minute where mom puts all the things she does and then shows dad doing jack shit. <laughs> And then they're like, Dad! And then everybody in the comments just unravels. Uh, they're like, wow, men are just trash garbage. And horrible. The and worst things to ever walk this earth. Which, If we like, didn't need them to replicate more women, pff, useless. Yeah, if, if you, my husband was doing what some of these mm-hmm. women are saying their husbands are doing, I would feel the same way. Well, I mean, that that's true. But it's created a huge dialogue online. Yeah. And I think, uh, again, because it's on TikTok, some of it is humor. Like some of it is like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You feel these feelings in moments. Like now, if it is what's happening to you all the time, then it's like, what? Yeah, that's not a great situation. Well, but a lot of people have been pointing out, like, why do we allow that to be humor? Like, why is that funny? You know, humor comes from pain. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. And so I I think that that's a good point. Anyway, long story short, Matt and I saw a wonderful creator. I believe the Yangs is their handle. And if you go and look at this TikTok on my TikTok page, we will link it in the show notes, the TikTok. All right. Uh, Their handle is in my caption. But 
they did one that shared a more equitable labor divide Mm -hmm. between the two of them. And it was like, mom's doing all of this. And then everybody, you know, gears up and is ready to fight because they're like, dad's not doing anything. Yeah. This trend is like where dad's a garbage human. Yeah. And then they showed all the things dad was doing. And I was like, oh, that's so nice. It's nice to see that on my For You page because that's how Matt and I operate. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need more examples of how that operates. And so we made one similarly kind of with our division of labor for bedtime routine. Yeah, evening kind of stuff. with our daughter. And the commentary has been fascinating. Yeah, very. It's been all over the place. I cannot believe the number of people in the comments who want to know who works. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. their their first question. Which is, yeah, that is funny because, oh, well, and a lot of it is like, well, who's bringing home the bacon? Which has nothing to do with what no. we were even, no, like, we, we didn't make any statement whatsoever. It was just simply us saying, hey, uh, while he does dinner, I make the grocery list. And while he cleans up the kitchen and resets everything, I give our daughter a bath. And yeah. get her dressed. And then whenever I'm done with that, I go clean up the living room and he puts her to bed. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, I'm food, bedtime. It has a lot nothing of that stuff. to do with, like, we weren't yeah. making some statement. And you're a big bath girl. So you just, you're like, I want a bath. Yeah. We should like, take a bath. Bath time. Yeah. I love It's a win win. Yeah. Uh, I like bubble baths. Yeah. So does our I'm kid. Extremely picky about my type of bubble bath okay tell me more i i'm really partial to tubby todd yeah tubby todd like, just the soap as bubble bath they have bubble bath too okay. and their bubble baths are really good but we're out of it sure so we're um, just using soap right actually we're not even out of it it's just not in our bathroom oh we just have to go across the house and yeah. get it out of <laughs> i think it's in perfect <laughs> so <laughs> well but it's dead to us never mind we're never gonna go get it it's the best bubble bath yeah in I, my opinion i wouldn't know i don't take a ton of baths I didn't know that it was the best bubble bath. I had been using Dr. Teal's, like just the mm-hmm. one that... Standard. And I, yeah, I love the lavender. I do. I mean, lavender's great. But the bubbles that Tubby Todd produces... Anyway, long story Tell short. Tell us about the bubbles. What's the difference? So the Tubby Todd versus others. The Tubby Todd has this really like fine okay. bubble. And it foams really well. Okay. And so the bubbles grow... And end up being like tall, kind of mountainous bubbles. Okay, fluffier. Rather, yeah, they're they're very fluffy. They're very like moldable almost. Like you can really play with them. Okay. And uh, they last a long time in the tub. So like it, it's like a sand versus gravel kind of. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Whereas your teals, that was like big bubbles. I wouldn't very say that that's gravel. I would say that's more of like a pea gravel maybe. Okay, we're getting really particular here. Well, there are some that are just like a graph. <laughs> They're just like like when Man. you put them like bubble maker yeah. bubbles. Yeah. That would be really funny to put in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <It's sticky. laughs> total aside, Yeah. the conversation ended up in the comment section being about all kinds of things, and we're going to get into that. Yeah, so division of labor has been a very hot topic. But I think we're going to go long on that. So we're going to do Greg's Reads of the Week, hit Word of the Week, and then we're going to get into the main story. Yep. And so. we'll be swinging around next week to talk additionally on this and hopefully answer some of your questions directly on the topic. So yeah, exactly. let us know what you want to hear. Uh, you want to start us off with Greg's Greg. And for context, Greg is my father-in-law, your dad. I got and a couple he, DMs yeah. this week saying that we should turn the g- 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 Greg for okay. the week uh, into like a sound. That <laughs> into a sound bite. Happens. Yeah. Like we should record it specifically. Yeah. G- 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 Greg's reads of the week. Yeah. Okay. My God. Yeah. Maybe cut all of that. It's terrifyingly <laughs> nonsensical. Anyway, article one. I don't even. I don't even know if these are in order. Watch this battery-powered Audi SUV concept turn into a pickup it's a concept pickup car truck thing did you watch this i didn't okay this was pretty cool is it cool so it, it is, sounded cool i was gonna look at it and then i was like this i gave me no anxiety by the way no yeah oh I, 
we forgot to mention, we rate these articles on a scale of one to five on how much anxiety they give us because often they're like, you're not saving enough for retirement. You're going to die alone and poor. Not really, but like that's where your brain goes sometimes. Yeah. We are an anxious generation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, anyway, this gave me no anxiety. None. No. It doesn't even, it didn't even touch the scale, but I did get excited to watch it because I love concept vehicles. Yeah. It fascinates me. I've always loved the look of a concept car and nothing ever looks like a concept car that they make. No. Maybe someday. Turns out it's probably like really annoying to manufacture cars that look like concept cars, but right. whatever. But this car, it has windows so you can see the road. Mm-hmm. Like not on the floorboard, but like on the, well, it is the floor, but the floorboard along the door. Oh, and like it also in the door panel. It's an off-road vehicle, and so it. Oh, so you don't like mm-hmm. run up on a. And it raises up and down, uh-huh. like you can control the suspension. The suspension, okay. but it's not. It's not. From what I understood, it wasn't like through the. You have to watch it. Okay. But the last thing that they show you in the video about it being a concept car, is the whole back of the car, like the the back window, like um recessing up into the roof Uh and uh, this thing popping up and like going against the back of the seats and then a window coming out of that and it makes it a closed in truck oh okay a small truck sure i mean but just a small truck bed it's cool okay sounds interesting really enjoyed this one great great read greg great reads yeah i read the, the headline and it looked interesting so yeah Anyway, next article. Warren Buffett says the ultimate test of a life well lived boils down to one simple principle. Mm-hmm. This was a very short article. Was it? Yeah. Well, it's only one principle. That makes like, sense. I read it in less than 30 seconds. <laughs> it was very short. Yeah. And one note's funny is it actually had <laughs> it's, one it's and three two. principles. <laughs> it, it was two things, which I understand how maybe whenever he spoke mm-hmm. about it, it was in one sentence but they broke it into two different things okay what can you tell us more do what you love with who you love oh okay like he was talking about how working at berkshire um like he is excited to go into work every day because he loves what he does but he doesn't only love what he does he loves who he does it with no any anxiety from the article no no warren buffett does not give me anxiety he's a chill bra (laughs) he's an omaha billionaire you know yeah he's a midwest daddy (laughs) You heard it here. Warren Buffett, Midwest daddy. Go ahead and clip that for TikTok. (laughs) Next article. A psychologist teaches us how to fearlessly step outside of our comfort zone. I read this one. I read read all of them. You read them all. Wow. Uh, She's been reading. This one, I would say like at least got on the scale like a two out of five. That's where I was going to fall. A two... Yeah, because it's like, well, yeah, what if I don't want to step outside my comfort zone? Yeah, and I read it, but it nothing resonated with me well enough for it to stick with me. Okay. <laughs> That's a recurring theme here. I can't read, so I don't read the articles very often. And you can't remember the articles, so. I remember it, but it didn't, like, do it for me. Okay. Nothing stuck. No. Not but like Warren Buffett. It give me more anxiety when I read it. Sure. I mean, that's a good sign. Yeah. And last article, Gen Zers want to retire by 60. How much to save monthly to get to 2 million? And then your dad also was like, that's not going to be enough. So when I read this, Mm -hmm. it gave me a little bit, like I would say a three out of five. That's exactly where I was going to fall. Middle anxiety. Right in the middle. It's not like you're going to definitely not make it, but like, here's what you need to do. Then I read the article. Uh Uh-huh. 12 out of 5. 12 out of 5. It only made me more anxious. Okay, tell me because more. this is one of those articles that I go and I read it, and I'm like, how does anybody retire? I don't know. I think we're just going to die working. Like, it's giving me, like, this is how much you have to save, and this is how much you make, and this is the percentage that you have to save, and all this stuff. And every time I read an article like that, panic for me. <laughs> just pure panic it doesn't make any sense to me yeah and i understand it i like 
I know I sound. That we're talking over the course of 20, 30, 40 years. Right. And anybody and like, that does understand this is listening like, Joe, this is how it works. No. I Like, I understand no, we how get the math. Works. Like, and the numbers. But, like, they're scary. But when I see them in front of my face, it just doesn't seem probable. Yeah. I, it, trust me. I get it. My long-term thinking is shot. I, I got nothing. Long-term thinking for me is, like, what's going to happen next week? And what dad was saying wasn't that 2 million won't be enough. It's that if you're retiring at 59. Oh, yeah. 2 million with the, like, if people are going to live as much longer as they mm-hmm. think they are, like, that may not be enough because you're talking, let's see, 2 million. Let's say you live to be 100 by the time Gen Z is on average. Yeah, we're definitely that's, living to 100. Right. That's four. Well, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, like, that, okay, it was easy math. <laughs> no, that's great. That That is good math. Sorry. Okay, but just do the math on that for me, okay? Mm-hmm. So let's say they live for... Let, we can do it less than that. Sure, no, no, no. That's great. But 40. That's gets, a nice number. But let's say you're saving $2 million combined for your family, like mm-hmm. for your, you and your spouse. Yep. You have 40 years between the two of you. Mm-hmm. I guess I'm not including any kind of... Um, interest. Interest or anything like that. Yeah. But that's only $50,000 a year. Yeah. I mean, the goal is that your interests that you would be accruing would significantly carry your expenses. And I just, all I was saying is $50,000 a year, like even in the economy mm-hmm. currently, even if you owned your home already, yeah, which that's going to be hard for Gen Z. Anyway, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's true. Point is, with inflation, if it continues in the direction that it's going. Or even in a normal how direction. How crazy is that? Because whenever I was in middle school, high school, somebody said eventually, like, you know, your goal is to retire with $2 million. I would have been like, $2 million? That's so much. Yeah. And it is so much, but it just doesn't go as far. Anymore. Not even close. Nope. That's wild. So. But it's still just as hard to save that much mm-hmm. as it's always been, I feel like. Probably harder because things are more expensive and wages haven't increased proportionately. Right. So... Anyway, so yeah, I, I started out at a three out of five, read the article, 12 out of five. Yeah, perfect. 12 out of five. Haven't read it. Don't really want to now. Yeah, don't recommend Seems it. Seems concerning. Have we been linking the articles in the show notes? I know uh, we, we haven't. we were going to do that. We haven't? No. Okay. Have we said that? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm the worst. Okay. I'm the one responsible for linking the articles, by the way, so you're welcome. Not really. That's a Matt job. Yep. Anyway, we've also invited people to share their reads of the week from their family members that oh, yeah. may or may not give you anxiety. I mean, ideally we'll they're going to be humorous. And we'll let you know how much anxiety they would give us. Yeah. And we'll, we'll rate it for you. Like, and mainly just so we can give Greg a break so he can stop getting dragged on the, the podcast every I week. I don't feel like we drag Greg. No, nah, not too bad. I appreciate the article. Like there was not an article in Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Someone's got to be reading and it's a, not us. Like that I didn't appreciate or understand why he sent it. For sure. You yeah. know? And all of it was good information. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't know. Like an Audi truck? Yeah. That was That cool. sounds sick. That was cool. Yeah. But if I'm going to save all this money to retire, I'm never getting an Audi truck. No. I no, for sure one. not. Is it electric? I have no idea. Battery-powered Audi SUV. Learn to read, you idiot. It is electric. <laughs> Battery-powered, I'm assuming. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, guys. I don't read and you don't comprehend. It's perfect. It's a good combo. Power couple. Anyway, word of the week. Are you familiar with the word petulant? Petulant? Petulant. Petulant. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. It's a good one. Okay. Petulant. Adjective. Cranky, pouty, irritable. It's often like a petulant child. Oh, okay. Like, Gardy was kind of petulant when we were like, hey, kid, we got to record. Like, she was pretty upset about it. Yeah. Very irritable. Okay. Petulant. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just a good little little vocab word. Sometimes when you have a lot to do, you're kind of petulant. Yeah, I can be petulant. I can be very childish. Can you spell it for me? P-E-T-U-L-A-N-T. Pet U. Lant. Lant. Petulant. Or pet U L ant. Pet you'll ant. Pet you'll ant. That sounds weird. <laughs> weird. Don't pet your ant. Petulant. Yeah, petulant. People were a little petulant about the TikTok we posted. Uh, people on TikTok can be very petulant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Irritable. I like it. Yeah. I like it's that good. one. It's even shorter than irritable, so it's very usable. And that seems like I could actually use it. Yeah. I'm trying to get back out of like 
17 letter words yeah I'm like you tend to do that and then i'm like i don't remember that anymore. and they a lot of times they're good words like they really do right succinctly describe a thought but you're never gonna remember them and no. if you use them a lot you're gonna sound like a real pretentious dingus <laughs> Like, it doesn't sound good. Well, and because be like, it's me, I won't even sound... Circumlocution. <laughs> Everyone's going to look at you like, nobody knows that word, buddy. Well, and I don't even think people would think I was being... Uh, what word did you use? Petulant or circumlocution? What no, are you talking about? you said, I'm going to sound really... Like, oh. Pom- you didn't say pompous, but... Like, educated or like... <laughs> Never mind. I don't know. I don't know that I used a word. You did. I can't rewind in my brain like you can, no. though. Well, I, you can I just, today. yeah. Anyway. We're waiting I for those drugs to kick in. don't think people will think that about me. I think they'll just be like, Joe, are you doing word of the day, like on your email? <laughs> How 2004 of you. Uh, like, word of but the day. I got it. SAT word prep. Yeah. I worked it in. Yeah. Did you take the SAT? No. Absolutely not. I don't think I did either. No, mm. you didn't. I took the prep. I took the practice test. Did you really? Yeah. You didn't take the SAT though. I didn't take the formal one, no. Your brother did. He did. He rocked He did very it. well. Yeah. Very, very well. He's a good test taker. Yeah, He's a he smart is. kid. Smart cookie. Yeah. Smart cookie. Yes, Matt's sir. Matt's little brother. Yep. Well read too. Yep. He read my, uh, he, he wrote my article. No. Wrote I don't my know if p- you should say that. No? No. 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 <laughs> he wrote some book reports for me because <laughs> he actually read the books. And I'm like, I don't read. I quit reading when I was about 10th grade. Which is so funny because I think you would really enjoy reading. I used to love reading. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. I probably would love reading if I just picked up a book and like actually focused for 30 to 60 seconds. Uh Uh-huh. Refuse. Okay. I mean, not refuse, but like it never comes Kind of. Like you kind of have that attitude toward it and I don't really understand it. I've written it off at this point. Yeah, but you're only 30. <laughs> like, that's the thing that's so interesting about you is you act like you're like 75 and you're like, oh, I've made it this far. Might as well never do that again. I'm like, you're only 10 years into your adult life. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like you are the infant of adults. Yeah. I watched a TikTok about that this week. Mm-hmm. Died. Loved it. It was like your 20s are like the infancy of oh, your Oh, truly. Adulthood. Yeah. Because you haven't been autonomous like doing your own thing. A lot of times you're not, until you leave college, you are still very much on like a track in right. life. And then it said your 30s are like your elementary years. Yeah. And then your, your 40s pre-teen, like, are like your teens of adulthood. Yes. That's when you go through your crisis, your, your yeah. rebellion. And then it was saying your 50s are your like actual adult years. And then your mm-hmm. 60s, you're the babies of the elderly. <laughs> Oh, you don't actually get to it like adulthood. You're just like, oh crap! Now I'm now I don't know anything the young people are doing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Nice. Well, I was hoping that maybe you'd get to like a a stage where you had it all together, but clearly not. Happens. That's true. I I don't believe in that actually, but I was hopeful for a second that maybe you'd become old and wise. All right, tell us all about division of labor. Division of labor. A lot of times it's called gender division of labor in technical terms and sociological terms. So I was doing a little reading on this so that I didn't sound like a complete dum dum <laughs> uh, when we talked about it. I mean, and we've we've done some. I'd say reading. It was an audio book together that yeah. we got ten percent of the way through. I finished it, Matt. You finished it? Yeah. You've read this whole thing? Well, yeah. listen to this whole thing. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. It's good to know. I yeah. should probably do that. About ten percent. So I'm gonna give the backstory on yeah. that. Yeah. Matt and I moved in together in 2017. Uh We were both working full time. Yep. But I worked from home Mm -hmm. and Matt went into an office. And I think this is where a lot of division of labor issues start for a lot of couples. Yeah. Whether, no matter who's staying home, whatever it is, I feel like division of labor is mostly a topic that's talked about how women unfairly maintain the majority of mental labor within homes yeah yeah and a lot of household and executive function labor and this is where i did a little bit of reading in fact there's a really good behavioral scientist i'm reading it like off my phone so i make sure that i say where it's from i'll probably link it in the the show notes actually link it not probably he will okay i will do it promise and that's the accountability i need to get things done anyway read this article and it talked about most societies there's a, a division for gender like you divide it into men and women typically and throughout most societies in history. 
And historically, we've divided labor along those lines because, especially way back when, there was a lot more specialization that needed. Like there was a lot more skill needed to complete a lot of the tasks. So like laundry was not just like put it in the washing machine with the right stuff, put it in the dryer, you're done. It was like you had to go through all the tools and like you needed to know what hap- like how to take care of everything. And like you were patching clothes and you were doing a lot more technical work. And so, and same thing with men, you were plowing, you were doing lots more, you you needed to be specialized because it was too much for one person to take on. Well, and women at that time too were having a lot more children. Yes. And they were pregnant often. Very often. Which I'm sure weighed into what jobs they took on because they didn't want to specialize somebody into something. And of course, there's the whole like what jobs they were allowed to take on in what societies like, you know, could they vote for a long time? No. (laughs) Like, (laughs) so there is a whole side of things that was like, maybe they wanted to do other things and they just, it was not societally approved. But the division of labor along gender lines is, is pretty common because it's specialized and like in different parts of the world, that specialization doesn't look like it does in the U.S. Maybe women are fishing or what like there are different roles but we're often dividing it up by gender and what's interesting is in like as technology has moved along and as less specialization is needed we continue to put a lot of the domestic which is what you were talking about is that a lot of the domestic labor has fallen to women and we still give all that domestic labor to women but we've specialized all the labor for men especially and so it's like or you're not doing a lot of it we don't have hundreds of acres that we're taking care of we're taking care of a quarter acre if you even are have any land at all and so it's we have this system that's split up by men and women and it's it's good to have a system to specialize and to divide labor but you can't just get rid of that and be like we're going to do all of it together because it still needs well, to be split up once upon for a time, time effectiveness. When there was the concept of men worked and women took care of the home. Mm-hmm. One, I think if we really get into the roots of it, I think it's always been inequitable toward women. Absolutely. But Completely two, agree. what you're talking about with like, let's say farming or going and working a labor driven job, men would go and work 10, 12 hour days. Mm-hmm working land, doing very physical labor. Yeah. And we've replaced that for a lot of people with a cubicle and... Mental, yeah. Like, it's just very different. We've also made it a very controlled environment, a quiet environment, like, for working, very oriented, like, not chaotic. It's very comfortable. Can be. Which, and being at home with kids, is inherently chaotic, too. I want to note on this podcast just this is kind of unrelated but Mm -hmm. I got a message from our last episode that was somebody kind of telling me their personal story and how they didn't agree with some stuff we said which after hearing the nuances of their story made perfect sense oh yeah we we Uh, talked about it and it was great but I wanted to kind of give a um, preface to all of this that anything that we're talking about we're talking about from our own experiences and it's not applicable applicable across Absolutely. Yeah, there's like, a huge caveat in this that this is You we have don't the know nuances of your situation. No. So, we're not well studied behavior sociologists. Yes. Soci- oh my gosh, I almost got through that sentence. But yeah, we're not you know, specialists on this. We're not educated. We just, we can't possibly know every angle of every story, but we are talking on a podcast. Well, and I was just going to say that on things that we talk on in general. Yeah. Like, you know. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Take it with a grain of salt. We don't yeah. know what we're talking about. Yeah. But, and uh, so we were talking that this this labor's divided and that you have to replace it with something. And that's where um, the big documentary right now is uh, Fair Play. And that was the book we were talking about earlier is Fair Play. Okay, I was going to get into that when you were done defining division of labor. But Got it. really. I'm bouncing all over. Yeah. <laughs> Medication's hidden. <laughs> so do you want me to get into the story of we'll get our back to the story. experience with this? Oh, okay. You're still defining. Yeah. Anyway. Well, have we defined it well enough? Should I stop defining? I I don't know that you have defined it. You keep like starting to tell people. Well, anyway, the division of labor is that typically there's a gendered division of labor. And yes. domestic tasks typically fall on women. 
And the problem is, and it's been a hot topic lately, I think partially because of the documentary, partially because of where we're at. And I know COVID has really accentuated a lot of this because everybody was working from home and it didn't necessarily divide the domestic tasks evenly. Right. Even when everybody was home. Which is what I was talking about whenever Matt and I moved in together. It was Mm -hmm. pre-COVID and everything. But I worked from home and Matt didn't. And so a lot of things fell on to me in terms of Matt's expectations. I don't know that they were conscious expectations. No. But he didn't understand how much I was doing because I was working from home. Because in my five-minute break or my, you know, when Matt would go and get, fill up his water bottle at work or whatever it is and then walk back to his desk, I could switch over a load of laundry at our house. Mm -hmm. Or I could get the bed made or pick up the kitchen or because I'm in our space. Yeah. You know, so when you work from home, there is this ability and privilege to work on tasks within your own home in your time off. But the difference is then all of that's falling on the person that's at home. Sure. And not only that, the person who is not at home does not witness or understand. No, it just happens magically while you're away. Yeah. And so there was a lot of frustration Mm -hmm. for me whenever we first moved in together because I was like, dude, because he would get home and be like, well, I just want to chill. Like, we're home all day. <laughs> yep. And I'm like, yeah, working just like you were. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> working. Yeah. And that's where I think the last couple of years have at least opened some eyes to what working from home really is. And like, it is still work. And there is like to properly work from home, you do need to take the time to concentrate and work. So what's funny is I never worked from home. No. Like even during COVID. No, you did not. Essential employee, building wet wipes, sanitation wipes. So I well, was back in the trenches still. But yeah, after about a year of living together, we, I, I started Googling, like, <laughs> how do I teach him about this? <laughs> because it's not that you, there was a lot of conversation of Matt being just like, well, well just let me know what I need to do. I'm happy yeah. to help. Mm-hmm. And there's not a worse sentence on this planet. No. Because no, I've I didn't want him to time. help. I wanted him to participate. Mm-hmm. I wanted him to be a part of the executive function. I didn't want to carry all the mental load and be a mom or a boss or a manager where here's the, here's the task list. Here are the things that are yours. Here are mine. I'd like, I was like, Mm-mm, I'm not doing that. Yeah. And you were kind of dealt a short straw on the executive function part. If you know anything about ADHD, uh, I barely manage my own executive function. And when I say barely, I mean, I really don't manage it well, but yeah, but I, what I will say is Matt's mom did an absolutely fantastic job teaching both of her boys life skills absolutely yeah because both my parents were working and so that division of labor i think there was still definitely a a domestic part that my mom took on and like she grew up on a farm and that was very like what she grew up seeing and that's very normal and so like she was very much in charge of dinner a lot of times i mean my dad would would make a dinner here and there and that kind of stuff but she was very um in that typical role but she was working too so there was a lot of times she was like i don't have the capacity to if you, again, the, the example I go to all the time is I was probably 12 and I wanted to wear like one or two black shirts that I really liked. Again, ADHD, neurodiversity thing. Like these are my two shirts I like. These are the ones I want to wear every single day. But I also was like, they need to be clean. And so my mom was like, here's how the washing machine works. And then after the washing machine, it goes in the dryer. And then you can wash your shirts however often you want. And while you're doing that, why don't you just go ahead and put all the rest of the dark laundry in with your two black shirts? Mm-hmm. And so I ended up doing a lot of laundry. Yep. And you're good at laundry. Yeah. I also learned how to make cookies that way. Because she's like, if you want cookies, here's how you make cookies. But I'm not like, go ahead, knock yourself out. I'm not a cookie machine. Let me know if we're out of flour. Uh, Well, and uh, you do the majority of the laundry in our house. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, Because I have grown up and I'm very particular about it. Very particular. What temperatures you wash in your clothes. At this point, I... I wish I just had a giant clothesline so I didn't have to dry anything. We could do that at our house. We could. We absolutely could. Not this time of year. Yeah, it's a little crisp out there. Anyway, long story short, we keep getting off track from the story. Always. (laughs) That's what the podcast is about. I started doing research and I found the book Fair Play. Mm -hmm. And that was in 2018. And so Matt and I were on a really, really, really long road trip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were bringing a car back from Phoenix to And we had a, what, 19-hour drive or something like that? 17, 19, somewhere in there, yeah. And we, I was like, I downloaded us this audiobook. (laughs) Matt was like, great. Yeah, my family grew up on audiobooks in the car, so I was like, 
sign me up. Yeah, yeah. he's like, great. And we got about an hour and a half in, I would mm-hmm. say. Yeah. And uh, Matt looked at me and said, can we turn this off? <laughs> and I said, what? Why? He's like, I... I just feel really bad. It's just making me feel really yeah. bad. And so, especially the book. So the document, I think the documentary is actually a really, like we just watched the documentary a few weeks ago and uh, I think it's an easier jumping on point and it, it puts faces with the stories. It's and like, easier to digest. It does not give you nearly, like the book is much more about the tools you use to actually divide the labor and like. And it's phenomenal. <clears throat> yes, and it, it Again, it's very much about building a system to replace the typical gender division of labor. And the first couple chapters are really all about giving the statistics and the factual information about how women have an inequitable amount of tasks Mm -hmm. put upon them. Yeah. So. And it's, yeah. So the first couple chapters are just like, here's everything women are doing. And here's the tiny bit that men are doing. Generally speaking. Yes. So painting with a very broad brush. But, you know, if you go by the statistics, by the numbers. Yes. Doesn't look good. It's not good. But, like... Even in homes where people feel like they're really working mm-hmm. together. And anyway. Yeah. And the funny thing is, is, like, I think it's something that, at, at, like, every generation continues to improve on. I so, agree. like, our grandparents probably saw a very very split division of labor and that's maybe back where it was more specialized and it was more important to do that and so they took on a little bit more than like my grandfather I'm probably took on more than his father took on and my you know his son has taken on more than he did in a division of labor and then their children will see a, a different split and like but even as you improve it does not mean that it's equitable right. and that's something that I think is really like should be thought about too is like just because you're doing more than you saw at home doesn't mean that it is split 50 50 right and so that's really an important framing i think that's that's good to take on and go improvement doesn't mean good enough yes and any improvement is good like always work to improve but it doesn't necessarily mean that you made it right and i think that's where a lot of like a lot of men i think get defensive there as they go well i do way more than My i ever, ever saw did. like yeah i'm taking like I'm doing all this stuff for my children and like that's stuff that my dad didn't do with us. And it's like, that's really good. I'm doing like the significant other is like, I'm doing all of the rest of it. Right. And most of the time now, uh, most houses are, are dual working houses. And that's a big conversation is I, I feel like through that comment section of our TikTok. People are like, well, who's making the money? Who's making the money? That's what <laughs> everybody wanted to know. They were like, well, if she's making the money, he should do all of it. And if, you know. and, and What's I'm, funny is you've always made more money than me. Yeah. Like but the whole just, time we've been together. To me, that's irrelevant because it's really sure. not about how much you make. No. And that's what people were really getting, at least well, in It's about household. people's time. What? It's about people's time. Exactly. And the value of your time. Exactly. So whenever it gets down to it and how Matt and I decided to split labor and we still to this day do is we look at how much time things take us. It doesn't matter if I bring in double the amount of money that he does. Mm -hmm. When we were both working 40 hours a week, like I took on what I could and he took on what he could. Yeah. 50, I mean, it's never quite like a... Oh, we still have tons of room for improvement on this, I would say. It's never a say. perfect breakdown of 50-50. Yeah. But... And I think a big thing in our house is the mental labor, the yeah. keeping track of it. And my brain doesn't keep track of anything well. So it's not a strength of mine, but it is something that... And that's what's been interesting. So I've, I'm coming up on a year of leaving my job and becoming basically a stay-at-home dad, but also doing some content stuff and, and working with you, you on the work business. From home, dad. Absolutely. I would say you work part time and then dad yeah, part time. Absolutely. But um it has made the mental labor much, much more obvious. And I think I've touched on this on the podcast a couple times. Like you get just a taste of the mental labor because again, as being a stay at home parent, I'm starting to spend a lot more time with our child. And so I know some of the things that would typically be the responsibility of a mom to know, quote unquote. Not that it should be, just the way it falls. You know, like I know what, you know, if, if she's getting treated for a diaper rash, I know the last time that got put on or something like that. 
you know what medicine she'd taken and what Absolutely. Time. I knew she took Tylenol at noon, you right. know, that kind of thing. And it like, uh, it's funny as a man to see it, like, just go to your head and you're like, why don't you know that? And that's absolutely like how women feel all of the time with all of the information. And so like, you can just see a little, it's given me a tiny window into what that looks like from the other side of things. And so that's been really good for me to see. And of course, very odd, like two work from home parents that I'm especially a stay at home parent. Um, and a, a, the opposite gender split of most people. So it's a, it's a very, again, this is not something that you can necessarily apply to your life universally. Our perspective is our perspective and it's weird. So, but it's been really good to see and it's been very helpful. Like when we listened to that, to the audio book in 18 or 19, whatever it was, um, I was working. So it was really hard for me to see that split and I did not have all of the context that I have now. And I think listening to it now would be very different. Like watching the documentary was very different. It was like, yep, I'm understanding more of this. I'm seeing more of it. I've seen some of it from both sides. And so I'm much more open to the perspective. So that's been really, well, really I, good. That's what I was going to say is I, I don't think that hearing other people talk on it is like for us. I hope that those of you listening that really want to improve your division of labor with mm -hmm. your partner, I hope that you don't look and feel like, oh, well, that only works for them because they both work from home or that only works for them because of their job or yeah. this or that. Really, I want you to listen and I want you to hear, oh, this is a new perspective that I can gain. And that perspective is going to give me the tools I need to create a system that works for my partner and me. Yeah. And evaluate it on your own basis. And the documentary was really interesting because they actually did a lot of analyzing of uh, same sex couples. Yeah. And because again, you are talking about for the most part, the same gender there. Right. And it's like, oh, well, there isn't a woman's work and a man's work if it's two men or two women. Or if there is, we're missing half of the work. Right. Maybe not half, but you get it. Well, and I think that's where a lot of our uh, detrimental stereotypes that we try to put on gay couples where we're like, well, mm -hmm. who's the man and who's the woman? Because yeah. <laughs> It's even, like who does what jobs and who doesn't do the jobs that make you a woman and make you a man. Right. You hear people ask that question yeah. or I have, I don't know. Maybe I'm just around worse people, but <laughs> <laughs> I've heard people ask questions like that all the time growing up through yeah. high school, college. Uh -huh. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Neither. That's not no, how that they're works. They're both the men. They're both the women. Yeah. They're <laughs> Unless they choose to not be and then they are what they are. But right. like. Like that's not how that works. But I, I, this gives me kind of a direct link mm -hmm. as to why culturally, among many other reasons, I'm yeah. sure, but why we do that. And it was really interesting because the documentary got into interviewing these couples and how they divide their labor and how they discuss and how they, and I was like, man, we have so much to learn yeah. from them. It was really cool because they were like, it turned from like, oh, well, I don't want to do the, the mom's job to like, oh, I just don't like doing that job, but someone has to do it. Like there is no mom, there is no dad. There well, is there no... is. There's two moms and sure. two dads or whatever. But I, I mean it in the labored right. role perspective of things. Yeah. The the jobs were no longer gendered. <laughs> yeah. The jobs were just like, we have a list of like stuff that needs to be done so that our child is properly cared for and like sustained. Right. And that's just, that's how it is. That's how, that's the reality of it. And especially as we've become less specialized, like both sides need to be taking on I couldn't equal believe amounts. the statistic that got me was I could not believe how many women are the breadwinners in their home. Mm -hmm. It's more than half for most demographics. I think maybe the only two demographics that it was not more than half was Pacific Islander and um, Asian. I believe. Yes. And those was... were the two that I, I definitely recall those. Otherwise it was even or heavily weighted the other way towards women. Yes. And uh, I found that fascinating because that was the argument I saw over and over mm -hmm. again. Well, he's bringing in the money. He's bringing in the money. Yeah. And there, are, I'm sure there are a lot of circumstances out there where there are stay-at-home moms. And I know that that's... And a big part of that is because of childcare. Yeah. And it's like so they get into that too is like, because the, the nice part about the documentary is that it has this two or three year window right after the book came out. Obviously COVID became rampant and like the... What pandemic that it was come out uh 19 i believe oh okay 18 or not like so it's it's published 19 who knows if like 
I know you were saying 18 is when we listened to it. I'm not comp like from what I saw, it was 19, but when in 19 and we all that stuff, to 19 then. but it was probably right after the holiday, whatever it was. doesn't matter. Oh yeah. It came out October 1st, 2019. We read it in December. Wow, okay. I didn't, I thought it was out longer than that. No, but the, the documentary does have this really interesting shift that happened in our society that went well now childcare became a really big issue because everybody was home. They couldn't just drop their kids off at childcare and we don't have a lot of childcare options and like that it, the options we do have are expensive and not subsidized and all this stuff. And it gets into historical perspective. There's some really interesting stuff from like the world wars when we were, women were doing a lot of the factory work and stuff. And so childcare became a huge thing because the men were off at war and the women had to make all our stuff. Yeah. And they had to make the stuff for the men to fight. And like somebody had to watch those kids. And so it became a very big subsidized industry. And then it fell apart again because ah, that's just how we do it. Because we don't value women and children. Correct. <laughs> Except for lifeboats. So I want to hop into a little bit today uh, before we get into voicemails, what our division of labor looks like. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to kind of leave it open for you all to ask us some questions. And we will be recording uh, part two where we directly kind of talk about our experiences, yeah. what our division of labor looks like, and maybe just answer some general questions. Yeah, get some have. outside perspectives that aren't just us because yeah. there's a whole spectrum of living situations and all that. But I, uh, how would you say that we break things down between the two of us now that we are in a well, not perfect, but a no. much more equitable. Again, absolutely, scenario. I would say that you still take on a majority of mental labor in our house. I agree. Um, and I'm just it's something I'm working on, but I'm definitely not good at. I barely took on the mental labor of living by myself. Like before, like when we were broken up, it was like, oh God, I have to do all of this. And then I just figured it out to a degree, but I also just did a piss poor job. You also a just avoided it. a lot of it. Correct. Mm-hmm. It was like, uh, I don't need to go to the doctor. I don't need to go to the dentist. All that stuff. So all of that executive function, um, yeah, is is something I'm working on developing. And of course, a lot of that is also the the neuro nonsense I have. So <laughs> um, no. So and we've talked. What's really interesting is we've kind of divided up um, somewhere along our strengths. Yes. Um, and so you've talked about like kind of your disordered relationship with food. Yes. And so. I really prefer cooking for myself because I have control issues and I want to know what's in my food and all that crap. So making food for me is not nearly the process it is. So I have for a long time, really the whole time G's been around, been the parent who is very involved in the food side of things or preparing food so that food is easier for you to do. Like one of the great things, Little Spoon, like when we had, this isn't an ad, be a great ad though. Anytime organically. we mention any product or brand, Matt, like they know it's not an ad. We have no, it's to true. disclose if it's but an it ad. But it is really funny because we did do ads for them and we were like, we love this product. Like we're doing ads and I don't know. Why people, is that like, funny? Any product we do an ad for is a product. It's true. Just like I think, the, I think the natural inclination when people see products advertised is like, oh, who knows if they actually use that. I don't know. That's me anyway. Well, no. And I understand that. But it's just funny because I feel like you make it even weirder. Because yeah, I like to look the weirdness right in the face and go, it's not that weird. Yeah, and I, uh, I think it's really good to have an honest do- dialogue yeah. around it. And I want people who listen to us and follow us online to know that the products that we, when we collaborate with brands, they're really things that we yeah. use and love. But, but Matt always acts like, he's like, it's so funny because we didn't add for them and we actually like the product. <laughs> And I'm like, that's with but every yeah, that ad is true. we do. That is really true. We turn down, we turn down the stuff we don't like. Anything or like doesn't fit what we do. It's a product that we don't actually use. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but like Little Spoon, they have prepared meals. And like, so between that and like me preparing food and me having stuff ready or just taking on the meals, um, that's how we fed the her. The Little Spoon was for me. Yes, absolutely. Whatever I had to be in charge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was, you know, making more of the the other stuff so From scratch yeah 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 honestly it was like me making my own meals and then sharing them seriously though if you're a mom who yeah <laughs> struggles if you need with food it we I those really, kind of services have been that, that one specifically for us was great i loved 
Yeah. I loved everything we got from them. Yeah. Across the board. It was even it was my mom like made but... some for her and she was like, the food's actually like good. Like yeah, I she was like, it. I tried it. She was like, it mom... actually tastes like stuff. Yeah. Your mom was like, I'm not feeding this to her without <laughs> trying it first and knowing if it's yeah. disgusting. Like, is it just flavorless? It looked good though. Yeah. It, like, sm- it always smelled good. Yeah. Everything. I didn't need it, but I did. I tried quite a few of them. I have texture issues. They kind of freak me out. But Yeah. Well, and that's a weird time in that season whenever yes. she's introducing, but they have baby led weaning and anyway, yep. yeah, that saved my butt. Yeah. That was, that was really, really good for us. So, um, yeah, meal time is a lot of times around us. Um, I did a lot of, as she got older, putting her down, um, partially because I think I was better at letting her not cry it out, but like self soothe herself. Um, mm-hmm. And you just have that very, you have much more visceral reaction to her being upset or self-soothing. And I didn't, I had a a level of detachment that you don't have as a mother, I think, especially when. Well, especially in that beginning part, because it wasn't like her crying or her uh, like losing it. It would be like if she made any noise at all or moved at all, I was like, oh, she probably wants me to hold her. Yes. Yeah, exactly. There is like this. And and there's a very real bond and like that's and funny there's like nothing wrong with that. No, if you pick up your like that's great. Yeah, whatever system works for you. But for us, like our child, literally, you, we couldn't transfer her down to sleep. Like she really had to self soothe herself we had in to place. Lay her down awake. Because if we tried to get her to sleep in our arms and put her down, she would immediately know. Then she would actually cry. And then she was set. like, "What are you doing? Don't get rid of me. Like, <laughs> I want you back." Whereas if we let her go to sleep on her own, she would like, okay, this is, I'm going to go to sleep. This is good. Yeah. Um, Which is funny because that's the opposite. I feel like of most parents it's experience. It's really odd. But we had to, if we laid her down. We can't asleep, soothe her. And she woke up, she would lose it. If we laid her down awake, she would just kind of. Yeah. She would just fall asleep. Chill out and go to bed. And it's still that way. Yeah. It's funny. Like she has to, she has to want to do it herself. Yeah. She will not. She cannot be forced to do anything no. for the most part. Not happily, for sure. And so I took on more of that. So feeding, and even because you were exclusively pumping, I did do a lot of the bottle feeding. Dishes. I did a lot of the sanitation on that stuff. Um, and I did a lot of the night feeds um, mm-hmm. when we had enough stored up that we could be, if, if there was an occasion. And she was a really good sleeper, so it was not that I did that for a very long time, but there was a period where maybe once a night, you know, one, two AM, uh, she would wake up and And then I would get to sleep all through the night, which yeah. was awesome because Matt would leave for work, so I would be on my own with G all day mm-hmm. while trying to get work done. Yeah. And a lot of times I would take like you would do a I would do a feeding before I left for work and so that she slept later in the morning. So you yep. had a couple hours early to get work done. Um but You're we, talking about yeah. our division of labor, though, with a newborn and like a six month old. What's our division of labor? Division like of labor now. now. I don't. Labor now, for sure. Yep. <laughs> anyway, was, I got very I, deep on the parenting side of well, things, which I think is a lot of where things flare up because well, it's easy to kind of do your own thing when you're a couple. I don't think that that's where things flare up. Mm-hmm. I think that that is where women lose their shit. Yeah. I think it's a problem long before kids absolutely i think i agree with that, that many women without children who may not want children are mm-hmm. having major struggles with this i think you ki- add kids into the dialogue and all of a sudden it is not sustainable for women to carry it all they no. can't the dam breaks yeah yeah i think that's i think that's a good point I, absolutely I don't think that's the same thing and that's where we talked about it before we had kids and yeah. i and i that is something i do remember you were very good about is you were like, before we have kids, I want to address our division of labor. Like, you're like, we need to be more equitable. And that made sense at the time, for sure. And I wasn't going to add something to our plate. No. Like a child and and a, a whole person who needs us yeah. um, and needs us to be our the best that we can be mm-hmm. um, for us to try and figure it out then. Yeah. It's and not a good time. if you're already in that situation, that's okay. It, you are this. where you are. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's awesome to start trying then, but that was very important mm-hmm. to me. But our division of labor now, I'm just going to run through it. And Yeah. Then I think it's better if we'll, you start because I keep wandering. I don't even know where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. I just start. <laughs> so our division of labor now, Matt and I kind of made a list of all the domestic tasks and executive function tasks within our home. Mm-hmm. And then we talked through what do we like 
to do or find enjoyment in doing. Mm -hmm. And that's where we started. So for me, uh, I don't mind folding laundry and I don't mind putting laundry away. Hate doing the laundry. Yeah. Hate sorting the laundry. Um, (laughs) But I, I don't mind to fold it and I don't mind to put it away, which is the opposite of Matt. Absolutely. I hate folding. Hate, hate, hate folding. I'll do laundry, transfer it between all day long. Couldn't care less. You'll separate it all out, make sure everything gets washed at the right temperature. I have refused at this point to fold much of anything. Uh, I've transferred my closet to almost entirely hanging storage. Yeah. And then stuff that doesn't get folded is like workout stuff. And that goes in like a bucket. It's like bucket of workout shorts, bucket of socks. Anyway, (laughs) see, this is why I can't be in charge of leading topics, guys. I'm just a mess. So then uh, (laughs) 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 it's just going to be me laughing. It's just laundry nonsense. Okay. So, uh, I don't like to do laundry though, and so Matt took that on. I don't. I, I uh, now I'm naming things I don't like instead of things I do like. Uh-huh. Um, but I I really like resetting and maintaining a clean space. Yeah. So at the end of the day, every day it comes very naturally to me to fold blankets, fluff pillows, kind of set things back where they were, and you know reset our space. I make our bed every morning. Like those are all things that just are instinct to me. And I kind of want to stop you there because that does bring up another kind of like flag for this issue. And that is men a lot of times are like, well, that's not important to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And that gets talked about a lot and that all the, all the sources talk about it as well. And, um, oh, well that's not important to me. So I don't think I need to do it. And a lot of times it's not important because they've never had to do it and it just magically takes care of itself. And it's like, have you ever had to face the alternative of what it looks like? Or have you looked down and thought about how it really affects you? Does it actually bother you and I just am taking care of it? And that's a big thing that we've had to address that all these sources talk about addressing. But it's something it's that really needs to be acknowledged. you said that to me? Years? Yes. Yeah, but that used to be a, a hotline of mine when we yeah. cohabitated initially. When we initially had this conversation, Matt was like, well, I don't know why I need to do that. I don't care if the bed's made or not. <laughs> and I was like, that's a bad reason. <laughs> and, and over time, I've learned it doesn't matter if you care if the bed's not made. If the bed's not made and it bothers your wife, it's going to become a problem for you. Like, if it affects your mental state, it affects me. Right. Like, that, that's just how it is. And so... Whether or not I care about it is not a deciding factor in whether or not it no, needs to be done. It is a task in our house that has to be done in the morning, uh-huh. whether you like it or not. Yeah. Or if it doesn't get done, negative like effects will follow. Right. And so uh, anyway, I, I kind of, I take on washing all our sheets though. That's a weird thing. You remember to wash them yeah. is really the thing. And so, They have to get really gross for me to be like, wow, these <laughs> got to be washed. And these I wash are a our, different color. I wash our linens once a week. Yeah. So I do that. So so it's not, we don't have it across. I'm the, the one board. to make like, sure they get bleached. Yeah. You're scared of bleach. We, I'm terrified of, <laughs> not of getting on the clothes. I don't like to use it because yeah. I'm afraid I'm going to get bleach on me. Yes. Yeah. It does like, it feels like it's going to magically like get everywhere. <laughs> like I feel like when I load the washing machine with bleach, I should be completely naked. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to bleach anything I own. Like I'm going to get out there in like a Tyvek suit or just completely naked and put bleach in there. Like, get everything out of the laundry room. Like, I need, like, a clean room environment. I get it. I've gotten over it. I'm getting better at it as I use more bleach. Like, you get more comfortable. I'm dying laughing at the idea of because my parents live with us 60% of the time. I'm in the laundry room naked. (laughs) Just with a bottle of bleach. Gas mask on. Terrified. (laughs) Yeah. It's a hazardous material, guys. Be careful. Anyway. Oh, we're unhinged. We are unhinged today. We're going to get into more semantics and details of this yeah. next week and we'll we'll arrive more structured. But we, guys, we had so much structure. That's the crazy part. That this episode has been unhinged as it has with how much I wrote you down. You just can't stop talking. No, I know. But you're not saying anything. No, that's the best part. I, I love it. Yeah. I'm enjoying it. I hope it. you love it. I hope you guys didn't stop listening 40 minutes ago. But Okay. I'm going to finish what our division of labor is like. I oh, need you to just stop. This talking. podcast is going to be two hours long, guys. <laughs> two parts, 
four hours. And we still, I'm still going to respond to a voicemail today. Perfect. But, okay, I'm wrapping this up. Cleaning. Mm-hmm. We got to the end of our list, so everything split up. And so it wasn't as defined as Matt's all laundry. Yeah. Matt's all, or, and, and Joe is all um, reset of living room or whatever it is. I don't know. Uh, we would actually break down tasks even smaller than that because there were different laundry breakdowns and things, like parts that I enjoy doing yeah. and parts that Matt enjoys doing. So we really tried to take... And then what you're left with is the things you both hate doing. Yeah. You're like, oh, yeah. Who's going to register our vehicles? Mm. Yeah. Matt. Nobody. <laughs> okay, exactly. Well, yeah, that's actually <laughs> very true. No one's going to uh, do it. Uh, and so that's, that's where it gets tough. And you have to kind of decide what works best and really define those tasks where mm-hmm. you guys both have some of them. And maybe it looks like you switch those things up sometimes. And I think it depends on who's who's got what capacity and like how well are you functioning. Like if I'm in a depressed state, like you're you're probably gonna end up taking on more than I can at the moment. If it's reversed, I'm gonna have to take on more. And it's it's never a, like great. You have this set of rules and like who does what. I think in a healthy relationship, you should always be able to go. I need help. I need yep. help with my part. I know it's my part. Can you help me? Yep. Like that's and always, both of us suck at asking for help, but. Well, I, I think we, that's what I was going to say is we've gotten in a really healthy place where a lot of times we don't even have to ask anymore. Yeah. Asking's great. But you know, if it gets to be nine thirty and Matt walks in and the bed's not made and I'm <laughs> working on something, yeah, he's just going to make the bed. Yeah. Like I'm going to come out and the bed's made and I'm like, oh wow, that's nice that not, it takes And a lot of times, e- even if it's not something that's on my mind, you're like, I know I haven't made the bed yet. And it's like, well, okay, well I can knock the bed out. No right. big deal. Like, but it's just keeping more of the communication together and like working on it over time. And like, maybe as you're doing all the laundry, you're going, I am starting to hate this. Like, well, can we break it up again? And or? like sometimes an evening will be really heavy with tasks that you take on. Like Matt does everything in our kitchen. He restocks our pantry. He does the groceries. He cleans. Andy does the dishes. Yeah. Like the kitchen is him. For some reason, it's very important for me to keep the kitchen clean, especially the sink. Sink drives me nuts. I've talked well, about it a hundred times. And I know a lot of people split up kitchen 50, 50, 50, quote unquote, sure. where one will cook, one cleans. Mm-hmm. But you're really particular about how you cook and how you clean. Well, like, and I want the cleaning done, like, right away. I don't love it stacking up. So, for me, stacking it all up and leaving it for you to get to when you have the capacity to get to it doesn't work for me. Like, it it will drive me nuts until it happens. And I've just gotten to the point where I'm like, if that's how you're going to be, you need to take it on. It's just the only equitable way to do it. Right. And so, but if Matt has to go to the grocery store and a bunch of stuff that night, He'll go to the grocery store and I'll empty the sink of dishes. Sure, and absolutely. Them in the- Load the dishwasher. Right. Just that stuff, yeah. So anyway, it's about balance. Mm-hmm. Ask us questions. Leave us voicemails. Um, DM us. Email us. It's all in the show notes. Yeah. And we'll get into this more next week in a more organized fashion. I hope. Maybe. We will. We probably shouldn't promise that, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. We'll try our best. Okay, I have a voicemail. Perfect. Hey, Matt and Joe, I really like listening to your podcast. You guys feel like my older siblings. I guess I was wondering if either of you have ever gone through like a friendship breakup. I'm a senior in high school, and I think my best friend and I are really going through one right now. I don't see us going to the same college in the future, and there's just a lack of trust between the two of us, and I don't know what to do. I'm just struggling because if we can't make it work now, there's no way we're going to make it work in college. And things have just been rough for so long that I don't know what it used to be like. I guess just wondering for any advice. Dude, <laughs> high school's hard. It is hard. I listen to it's that. It's like bringing tears to my eyes. I know. <laughs> like that, yeah, brings back some feelers. Yeah, uh, high school's hard. And it sucks. Me start it's great, with. But it sucks. I don't want to sound dark <laughs> or sad. <laughs> Uh, here's some nihilism for you you know i'm gonna i guess i'll start with an example when i was leaving high school i left high school with not great relationships with my friends that i was friends with all through growing up through high school absolutely yeah 
Um, not that we didn't talk to each other or anything like that, but we were not our best. And let me just say, as you're finishing up high school, you're in some of the biggest seasons of transition that you experience and you're still, you're still a kid. And you've been given absolutely no tools to deal with it. Right. Like you're building your tools right now. I want you to know that a few of my friends from high school that I'm talking about that when I was your age, I didn't have a relationship are some of my most trusted and loved people to this day. And we went years where we would only talk once a year. Uh If that. Yeah. Um, And not that it has to work out that way. And Matt will definitely speak to a different experience, I Mm -hmm. think, but Mm -hmm. I think of my friend Amy and my friend Bren, who I've known since middle school. Bren I've known since we were kids. And uh, we're still really tight. And now we're in a space where it's funny because we've gone completely different directions. Um, Some of us are planning to be kid-free forever. (laughs) Some of us are, you know. Right in the middle of kids. Yeah, right in the middle of, you know learning to be parents yep. and being homeowners. Some of us are big wig lawyers in New York city. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, guess which one we are. Yeah, yeah, mm, we're big not wig those. lawyers in New York city. You got it. And, uh, we found our way back to each other. So what, what I would say is don't focus too much on the relationship and all of that. Really take this time and focus on yourself, what you want, where you're yeah. going individually on your own. And what do you like? What makes you happy? Mm-hmm. Um, and give people lots of grace and space to be uh, kind of shitty. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so much of it is just that while you're going through it, your friend is also going through it. And like you may or may not know what's going on in their life uh, behind the scenes, so to speak. And Um, it's, it's hard. It's just a, it's a really tough period. And like, I remember I had that, uh, my senior year, um, I kind of got shaded out of my friend group, the friend group that I'd had for a long, long time. And so they started doing stuff without me and I started not getting, uh, getting the invites to everything. And, um, it was hard. It was really hard. And I had, uh, kind of a similar experience post college and, uh, the thing is you will develop friends along the way as long as you keep yourself open and really work on yourself. And that's the best thing you can do is, is learn who you are at 16, 17, 18. You don't know who you are. You don't even know that when you're 30, 30. That's true. That's a, I mean, that's a fact. I don't know a hundred percent who I am, but I know more about what's important to me and what I appreciate. And, uh, it's these kind of times that make you value your friends and value your family. Um, I think at least for me, that was the case is, uh, I had to have my friends and my family, um, put at a distance to make me really appreciate having them to go. Wow. That is it's people in my life are really important to me. I need to be better about being there for them, supporting them, uh, being a friend worth having. And not to say that this is anything on you. You not sound like you a very, not. absolutely. It's just, um, you're just about to go into a season where you're going to meet a lot of new people yeah. and you're going to have this opportunity to build out new relationships and maintain old ones. Mm-hmm. And so really focus on the excitement of that. And, and some distance and some time can really give you some perspective, both yes. of you some perspective. And, uh, you can look back on it with a little more nostalgia and say, Hey, remember the good things that happened. That was 100%. fun. And you can reconnect when you come back from college, you're going to have breaks at the same time. You're going to come back for Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays, that kind of stuff. Um, and sometimes those are not going to be good. No. And sometimes those are going to go really badly. Or at and least sometimes they did for me. I had a lot of soul They can crushing. be really fun. Yeah. I, I had a lot of soul crushing <laughs> trips back home during college where I was really expecting my friends to be like, show up. And, yeah, yeah. And it to be exciting and fun to see each other. And I did not get invited. No. And, uh, it wasn't about me, but I only know that now because yeah, I'm older. Uh huh. I don't see it that way. And it, the time gave me perspective. Yeah. Like, we're thinking about you. It gets easier. It really and it does. Gets better. And just, yeah. 
hold it together. You're going to meet more people. And like college will be a time when you're, you're forced to meet more people. And like you're going to find your people and you're going to find out who you are and what people you want. And 100%. it sucks. And it's fun. And it's great. Yeah. It, it, it's the highs and lows. But anyway, on that note, we love you guys. Yeah. We have anything. We're, we're going to hit Division of Labor Part 2 tomorrow. Yep. Uh, and uh, tomorrow? What am I saying? Next week. <laughs> Not tomorrow. We're going to hit Division of Labor Part 2 next week where we're going to be answering more of your questions and getting into the nitty gritty of what our Division of Labor yeah. looks like rather than just the concept itself. For sure. So rate and review the podcast. Give us five stars. Follow us on all the things. Yeah. And Do you want to email us? Uh, oversharing at joejohnsonoverbead.com. Yep. Um, so if you want to send us your reads of the week from your family, if you want to send uh, thoughts in on anything we talk about, you know, written out voicemail kind of thing, send it there uh, or DM us on the platforms, yep. all those and uh, voicemails uh, oversharing with uh, speakpipe.com. It's in the show notes. It'll all be in the notes. All right. Love y'all. <laughs> Bye.